Hello, everyone. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Dr. Sperlstein and all the donors for this conference. That's been so wonderful. And Dr. Roy, I wish you had been my English professor. I would have loved the class. Um, I didn't necessarily like my English class when I was in college. Today, I will be speaking on the ethnic Mexican history of the Southern Great Plains, and that history's interconnections with water. Out of the various places in time we can begin the Mexican-American history of the Southern Plains, I like to choose the Francisco Vasquez de Coronado's colonial expedition into the North American prairies. While searching for the mythological seven cities of gold and making war against Pueblo people in present-day New Mexico, the Coronado, Coronado expedition heard of Rumos of Guivera, a place deep in the grasslands of what we now call the Central Plains. Guevara supposedly held such great wealth that its lords ate out of golden dishes. Driven by potential, fortune, and social gain, the Spanish acquired two captive Plains origin men at the Pueblo Plains Indigenous Trading Center of Pecos, bordering the Pecos River. The two men were got to guide the contingent of the expedition towards Guevara. The expedition members called, called the two men El Turco y Sopote. A Turco was likely from a Pani uh, community, while Yusupote was from a Kivera, from Kivera itself, which would have made him a Wichita person. Thus began Coronado's 1540 through 42 trek through the plains of present day eastern New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas. However, the search for cities rich in precious metals consisted not only of Spanish friars and soldiers like a lot of Texans here in the High Plains learned in school, uh, and that inspired the architecture of this university in many ways. European expeditionaries also came from France, Italy, Scotland, and Greece. Then there were the indigenous people, North African Moors, and Sub-Saharan Africans who were enslaved, who were servants to the European, to the European expeditionaries. In all likelihood, the number of servants and enslaved people equaled or exceeded the 400 European men at arms. Then the European men, instead of wearing uh, shining armor like it's depicted in paintings, they usually actually carried Aztec armor and Aztec weapons. European women and excuse me, European women and indigenous women from what now is Mexico, New Mexico, and the Plains also made up a vital part of the incursion. In addition, the expedition included at least 1,300 Indios Amigos, or Indian friends, from the Valley of Mexico and elsewhere in New Spain. Together, the number of indigenous allies, servants, and enslaved individuals meant that in human terms, this expedition was overwhelmingly native to the Americas. Like innumerable indigenous Plains people had done for millennia, this diversity of humanity Search for what, search for and follow the natural resource most needed for survival, water. Rivers, creeks, and especially springs that flow, flowed from the rich Ogallala aquifer provided people with reliable water sources. Having sought those sources with the same drive, if not even more so than their search for Quivera, the expedition members would have encountered indigenous Plains people, perhaps at the times meeting on the edges of the Plains waterscapes. Whether through loving relationships, short affairs, or rapes, there were 1,500 indigenous, African, and European members of the expedition, surely intermixed with Plains, Apaches, Caduans, and other mobile bison hunters. The expedition's members established temporary relations and made camps with these 16th century Plains people. Those camps would have been located near or along the Plains streams and springs. At these water sources, humans could be could to be built in temporary relations and enduring communities and established trading grounds. Such human interactions further combined with the native people who willingly joined the expedition and those who the expedition forcefully obtained. Some indigenous allies chose to remain with Pueblo people in New Mexico, and it is possible that others chose to remain with Plains people as well. It is also likely that the expedition trafficked its enslaved members while on the Plains for supplies, or to gain favor from the indigenous Plains people. Much as people from across the globe and the Americas intermingled and crossed ethno-racial lines in Mexico, they did the same thing in the Plains. 
Thus, we can interpret this as the first interactions, often along the plains waterscapes of a forming Mexican people, European, African, indigenous. Such patterns continued when Juan de Oñate reinitiated Spanish colonization of New Mexico in 1598. During the following year, Oñate sent a multiracial, multicultural, and multiethnic group to investigate the Southern Plains and procure bison meat for the colony. As the 17th century progressed, New Mexico saw a continual migration of people from the interior, interior of New Spain. The intermix with Pueblo people had, or, who had already extensively intermixed with Plains people. Thus, multiracial and multicultural no Mexicanos and ethnic Mexican people would become part of the social cultural value of the Southern Plains. No Mexicanos and Plains tribes, especially the Apache and later the Comanche, raided one another for cattle, horses, and people. Other points, indigenous people um, and no Mexicanos peacefully traded with one another for other Mexicans and for Plains people captured in what is now South Texas and Northern Mexico. In this way, captive Mexicans, particularly women and children, became kin to the Apache, Comanche, Kiowa, and others, while captured indigenous Plains people became servants and eventually family members in New, Mexico, New Mexican families. However, peace allowed Mexicans to further ingrain themselves within the Southern Plains. Early known Mexicanos who extensively intermingled with indigenous people were ciboleros, bison hunters. Known Mexicanos hunters adjusted to the plains by adopting indigenous plains people's hunting meat and meat processing techniques and knowledge of water sources, while plains Indians adopted known Mexicanos horses for hunting and of course militaristic use. Ciboleros in turn became camancheros, known Mexicanos who traded with indigenous plains people especially the Comanche who had conquered the Southern Plains during for the first decades of the 18th century. But often, the two occupations were indistinguishable. Cibuleros carried trade goods and Comancheros regularly hunted bison during their treks. During such treks, according to New Mexican folklorist Fabio La Cabeza de Vaca, springs of sweet water saved many travelers from dying of thirst on the way to the Buffalo and Comanche territory. The Comanchero trade relationship along with an increasing cibolero hunting began at least by the 1750s when the Spanish governor of New Mexico initiated, initiated a series of peace agreements with Comanches aimed at fostering peace and spurring the regional economy. Having made peace with the most powerful actor in the region, Nahu Mexicanos were able to hunt and trade on the plains. These peace, while periodically broken and renegotiated, meant that the plains and plains water would forever become fused with the Mexican social cultural world. In her memoir that has become a classic of Nuevo Mexicano literature, We Fed Them Cactus, Fabiola Cabeza de Vaca elucidates the long-term social cultural connection her family and friends had with the Plains. Cabeza de Vaca details how Nuevo Mexicanos no Mexicanos placed their names uh, in their language on landmarks and watermarks across the plains, demonstrating the, the historic presence of her ancestors in the region. For example, Cabeza de Vaca recorded the memories of one old Mexicano, she called El Cuate, who was involved in the mid 19th century bison hunting and trade on the plains, but whose description could really fit to much earlier times. I quote, it took about two weeks to make the trip from Las Vegas, New Mexico to Palo Duro Canyon and then to the Quericue country, east of us today. He continued, as we traveled along, we met other caravans, and when the, we reached the bluffs, bluffs of the Llano Estecado, we were many companies, some were already there, and it became this small world, this big land of New Mexico. The stories Cabeza de Vaca heard as a child during the early 20th century tell us that Southern Plains Palo Duro Canyon and the fork of the Red River that runs through the canyon, along with the canyon springs, were once the goal, the goal of ciboleros in their search for the best hunting grounds and reliable water sources. In the folk culture of 19th century and even 20th century, no Mexicanos, Palo Duro Canyon, other landmarks, along with the waterscapes of the plains, became part of their world, this big land of New Mexico. Through their knowledge of the plains watering spots, 
landscapes and trails in addition to viable coexistence with indigenous plains people. No Mexicanos would build trading posts and more permanent settlements within the plains, within the Comanche territory and the territory of other indigenous people. From the 1790s on, hundreds of Nomecano families began migrating eastward. During the initiation of the movement, farmers began to till the head of the southern plains, while pastores, sheep herders that we've mentioned before in this conference, would leave the New Mexico and southern Colorado mountains, drifting down onto the plains in search of vast prairie grasses and rich watering spots. As the flocks grew through the first half of the 19th century, pastores had often participated in hunting and trading began establishing pueblos and ranches on the western southern plains. They sought land where the ground was fertile and there was water for their herd animals. According to Cabeza de Vaca, making sure the sheep had easy access to water was one of the most important requirements when seeking grazing lands. Depending on their location, these plains communities subsisted on an intermixed economy of shepherding, farming, trading with indigenous plains people, bison hunting, and tapping into the Santa Fe Trail. Moreover, starting with the United States conquest of New Mexico in 1846, sheep trading boomed with open access to U.S. markets. Responding to the sheep sector's growth, for example, Pastores founded Plaza de Missouri uh, outside of present-day Roswell, New Mexico, sometime around 1850. It had previously been a cibolero camp set on the north bank of the Rio Condo. The town's founders had participated in trade involving bison, indigenous plains people, in the Santa Fe Trail that reached into Missouri, hence where they got the name of the town. Once making the Southern Plains their permanent home, the community built an extensive irrigation system, indicating that they saw a long-term future in the Plains while using its water resources. Indeed, the descendants of the Plaza de Missouri's founders still live in Roswell. Hundreds of miles deeper into the Plains, one training point in traditional, untraditional indigenous gathering place on the Quiriquia Canyon country along the Quiriquia Creek developed into a cosmopolitan place. By the early 1860s, Quiriquia became an established point of plains trade and Nuevo Mexicano population. So this Mexican town was built on what was a meeting place for indigenous people. At this watering spot, several trails met. At Quiriquia, diverse people traded products originating in New Mexico along the Santa Fe Trail on the Camino Real from the interior of Mexico for stock animals and captive people raided from Texas and Mexico by Plains Indians. At Quiriqua, Mexicans also introduced irrigation and farming techniques practiced in northern New Mexico and the U.S.-Mexico borderlands to the southern plains. Pastores turned farmers dug acequias, or ir irrigation canals, from the plains rivers and creeks in order to water tracts of land ranging from whole fields to small gardens. New Mexican acequias integrated Iberian irrigation methods with Pueblo flood irrigation techniques and Pueblo farmers' environmental knowledge of the Southwest landscapes and waterscapes. Southwestern indigenous irrigation techniques generally centered on the flood cycles and the use of small-scale water, watering places. Through their firsthand and, and ancestral knowledge of the plains, waterways, and landscapes, the pastores followed such blended irrigation systems that they had brought from the Southwest. In 1863, Isabel, Isabel Gurule, Gurule, excuse me, a pastor originating from Anton Chico, New Mexico, settled, settled over 100 miles northwest of Curiquay. He arrived with his cousin and his cousin's family. They constructed, constructed a dugout along the middle Alamosa Creek, south of the Canadian River in what would become Odom County, Texas. The Gurule dugout endured intact into the 20th century. Like people before the Gurus, they used what the land and water provided. They took advantage of the slope leading into the creek to construct a dugout half of the slope's earth. They also utilized the cottonwood trees and grew, that grew along the plains waterways to support the dugout's flat mud and grass roof. But by the 1860s and the early 1870s, the U.S. Army and Anglo-American bison hunters encroach upon the southern plains, harassing the com and committing violence against Camancheros along with the Cibuleros in order to end their profession and thus dismantle the southern plains, tribes, and commercial networks. Knowing the importance of Mex that Mexicans played on the plains economy, they were often the first people attacked because the army charged if Mexicans were attacked and they couldn't charge with the indigenous tribes, 
indigenous tribes would have no choice but to give up since their main trading partner would be gone in many ways. The final systematic change came to the plains as a result of the U.S. Army's Red River War campaigns from 1874 through 75. By then, the bison population was on its way to industrial destruction. As the bison population collapsed, the food waste and economic life of indigenous plains people, as well as their Novo Mexicano trading partners, disappeared forever. Preparing for winter without the required life-giving bison provisions or foodstuffs obtained from the Comancheros. A coalition of Comanches, Kiowas, Cheyennes, Arapahos, and others took rich shelter in the region's canyons and river bottoms during the early fall. Within the refuge of the Palladuro Canyon and its water sources, the worst decisive battle took place during the September of 1874. When the defeated Allied Plains Indians fled the Palladuro for the plains, they could see the thick smoke rising from the canyon as the U.S. troops burned their meager meat supply along with their hides, robes, and rifles. With that fire, the Southern Plains tribes last tied to independence dissolved in the air. The thick smoke rising from the canyons, canyons also signaled the end of the Comanchero in Cebolero lifeways. Yet through their knowledge of the plains, along with their cultural background as livestock raisers, hunters, and traders, plains Mexicans would adapt to the new reality of the plains. Though not the government's intended ethno-racial group for the occupation of the southern plains, no Mexicanos knew the trails, the water sources, the land, the flora, and the animals of the region. As Mexicans moved into the plains, they did so almost exclusively as pastores. Fabiola Cabeza de Vaca wrote that for a time, grass and water were plentiful, and the stock raisers had all the land they needed for grazing. In addition to moving to already existing communities, pastores established dozens of small pueblos along the many ranches, along with many ranches alongside the water sources of today's eastern New Mexico. Northwest Texas, southeastern Colorado, the Oklahoma Panhandle, western Oklahoma, and perhaps southwest Kansas. Thus, when Anglo-American cowmen colonized the plains during the closing years of, 1870, of the 1870s, Mexican pastores had already made the region their home. Under this new wave of colonization, plains Mexicans endured mostly untold acts of violence ranging from beatings, shootings, to mass killings, and the destruction of entire communities. Descendants of Plaza de Missouri's residents remember why their ancestors began to abandon the town during the mid-1870s. Their descendants retain the memory of, I quote, white Texas entering their communities to steal the cows and fight with our relatives, not simply for land, but the, for access and control of the Rio Fondo, the community sat alongside. More directly, the demise of Quiriqué demonstrates the intense level of violence Pastore suffered. By 1871, brothers George and Jim Baker claimed the land surrounding Quiriqué. Quiriqué's long-term residents themselves, nevertheless, remained since the Baker's first ranch manager had no trouble with them. But the peace fell apart by the fall of 1878 when O.J. Wyron took charge of the ranch. When he took charge of his first move was to get rid of the Mexicans. Wyron, I quote from a letter written by Frank Collison, one of Wyron's ranchers told them to leave, but never offered to buy them out. A few days later, he took his outfit and went to the town. Once reaching it, the outfit, quote, commenced to shoot them up. They then set the community on fire. And what was left of Quiriqué's population went to the Mexican settlements on the Canadian River, over 100 miles north. That is, some Mexican settlements along the Plains waterways survived at least a bit longer and now offered a haven to the refugees. And this is a map of only a few points of violence out of the many more that I have been able to find in published sources and archives against Mexicans on the 19th century plains. Notably, all the points that I've been able to find were all along water sources. This was, of course, because cattlemen and others not only wanted to control the land, they also wanted to control the precious resource that was water. As Fabiola Cabeza de Vaca noted, in the days of the unfenced range, Herd animals freely water the arroyos, the springs, and water holes. That is, to control the plains, cattlemen also had to control the plains' water. Under the threat of violence, pastores adapted to remain on the plains. Some pastores managed to buy land, but far more became cowhands and wagon traders that made the cattle industry's growth possible. For example, Isabel Gurule, the laboring pastor that arrived 
on the grasslands in 1863, who stuck out at disgust, became a freighter and then a cowhand. Uh, but the late 1870s and early 1880s, ethnic Mexicans from South Texas and Mexico charged, charged northward, northward along cattle drives, joining the previously established Plains Mexican communities. As anthropologist Nancy Gonzalez noted, no Mexicanos recognized the obvious cultural similarities between themselves and those south of the border. After all, throughout its history, New Mexico had been thoroughly willing to borrow heavily from Mexican culture, carrying the existence of Mexican ethnic identity in New Mexico into the 19th and 20th centuries. The title of my talk, Cactuses Hold Water, refers to Fabiola Cabeza de Vaca's seminal work, work, We Fed Them Cactus. Cactuses hold water in reserve over time, times of drought, to protect themselves. Diana Reveldo, one of the foundational voices of Mexican-American literary criticism, asserts that the book refers to one, at one level to the drought of 1918, when Mexicans in eastern New Mexico fed cactus to their cattle for survival. On another level, it refers to the plains Mexican themselves, as survivors able to weather misfortunes, the changing borders of North America, and colonization, as well as to find water sources needed to survive on the plains. Which is why they did, which is what they did for centuries and continue to do. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions, or should we all go eat? <laughs> yes. It had several names. So the most popular name it had was Plaza de Missouri but it was also called Plaza de Hondo, and it had two or three other names. Um, but it all referred to the same community. Any other questions? No one, not everyone jump up at once, please. Yes, please. Yeah, I can send you the paper. Well, no, it's that, and um, can you talk more about we said the cactus? They were so excited about the idea of water and cactus. Yeah, definitely. So, as far as I can tell, the Fabiola Cabsevaca came up with the title because her ancestors lived in eastern New Mexico, in the plains of New Mexico. And she remembered her parents and grandparents telling her several times about how during times of drought, they would pick up cactuses and take out the needles and feed them to their cattle so they would have food and water in hopes of surviving for another year. So that's where the title came from, just the extent of their knowledge of where to obtain water in the plains. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for your talk, it was great. Um, could you talk a little bit about these uh, early years some of them are still around, or are they transformed into the asequias that we still see in, in, in New Mexico? Yeah, so in New Mexico, asequias mainly just survive uh, in the mountain communities that are still majority um, Mexican or Hispanic. Uh, on the plains, I think most of the asequias have been filled with dirt, just with the wind, or with modern farms that haven't needed them. But um, Alex Hunt took me uh, along with the group near Curique, uh to the town that was burned. Um, and there were still signs of the acequia they had built. Uh, you could barely see it because it was overgrown with grass, but you could see the indention in the earth still. So I'm sure archaeologists who know where to look would be able to find these throughout the plains. Well, thank you for hearing me out, and I hope we all have a great lunch. <laughs>